Thanks everyone. It's great to see so many of you here today. So welcome to building single page applications with ASP.NET Core 2.0. Just a show of hands, who's currently building single page apps? Right, that's like 50% of the room, that's great. Um, and so for those of you uh, who are building single page apps, how many people are using uh, .NET Core backend? Okay, not so many, so about 20%. So today, I'm gonna to show you a really simple approach to building single page apps with ASP.NET Core. I'm Jason Taylor, and I'm a SSW solution architect. I've been developing software now for about 17 years, and a lot of the time it's been with the .NET stack. Uh, over the last two years, I've been lucky to work with .NET Core, and I've shipped a number of applications to production. I specialize in building single page applications with ASP.NET Core. My focus is Angular, uh, but today I'm gonna to show you an approach that will work with uh, your favorite client-side framework. So if you're using React or something else, this is the same approach that you can follow. So I'm gonna cover three main topics. First, we're gonna cover getting started with SPA. And in this topic, we're gonna actually show you how to get your tooling up to scratch and how you can actually create your first project. I'll also go over uh, the features that are included with this approach. Um, pretty, pretty cool. So then we're going to look at building a web API. Now, I know you guys know how to build a web API, but I'm going to show you some tips and tricks to take it from a typical web API to something that's a little bit more advanced and a lot easier to work with. And then finally, we're going to talk about the open API specification. So hands up, who's heard of open API? OK, cool, so about 20%. So who's heard of Swagger? OK, everyone's heard of Swagger. So that's what Open API is. Open API is the initiative that came out of Swagger, uh, and they're helping to drive that forward. So let's have a look. If you're building a application using uh, a single page application using ASP.NET Core, what we can do is use ASP.NET Core JavaScript services. So this is Microsoft's uh, tooling to make building single page applications with the .NET Core stack really easy. So it has built-in support for SPA, and it supports all major client-side frameworks. So there's about five different frameworks that it supports, and I'll show you each of those in turn. It's cross-platform, so you can build on Windows, Mac, or Linux, uh, and that means you use your favorite OS. It, it really doesn't matter. You can also use your preferred uh, editor. So if you're using uh, Rider or VS Code or Eclipse, that's fine. You can use anything. Uh, so let's have a look. If you're using Visual Studio 2017, you just have to make sure that you're on version 15.3 or greater. And if so, all you have to do is go File, New Project, select .NET Core, and select ASP.NET Core Web Application. And then you can go uh, and select either Angular, React, or React and Redux. So pretty simple out of the box. Now, if you're not using Visual Studio 2017, that means you're using the .NET Core SDK from the command line. And you can go ahead and just run .NET New, and that'll give you a list of templates that are available. So this is, again, out of the box. So out of the box, you have ASP.NET Core with Angular, React, or React and Redux. Now, I promise that there are additional templates, and there are. If you run this command, you'll also get uh, Aurelia, Knockout, uh, View, and that's about it. So how do you get started? So from the command prompt, .NET New Angular, you get a brand new application uh, with ASP.NET Core and Angular. So pretty simple, right? That's the simplest approach. So it wasn't always that easy, though. When I first started out, um, I actually created a quick start for uh, building these applications on my blog. And um, I thought, oh, yeah, this is a quick start. I've got it all figured out now. Uh, so I'm actually going to um, blog about this and show people how easy it is to get started with Angular uh, and ASP.NET Core 2. And so just scroll down to my other posts. And I thought, that's great. Got it sorted. So where is it? Here it is. Angular, that's the older one. Older. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Here it is, quick start. So I thought it was a quick start, but it really wasn't. So I have to apologize for that. Before you got started, if you didn't meet the prerequisites, you actually had to follow this guide and this guide. So there was two guides to follow before you could follow the quick start. And then you could scaffold a new application. All oh, right, quick start, right? And you had to install Yaoman, and you had to install the ASP.NET Core generator. And then you could come down here, and you had to configure TypeScript. And then you had to 
you had to come down here and you had to install your client dependencies. And then you had to configure ASP.NET Core. And then you had to do a whole bunch of stuff that just didn't fit under any other subject. You had to complete the application. So just keep going and going and going really quick. And then you, and then you were good to go. But today, it's really different. It's .NET New Angular. So that's just fantastic. And it's uh, for Aurelia. If you're an Aurelia programmer, it's .NET New Aurelia. .NET New Knockout, React. React and Redux and Vue, all out of the box, ready to go. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at how we can get started. So I'm going to fire up a command prompt. I've got an empty directory here. I'll fire up a command prompt. Now, I'm not typically a command prompt developer. So I like to do a few things to get in the zone when I'm using the command prompt. First thing to do is change the color, because you can't be a hacker if you're coding on black and white, right? So I change the color to green, helps me get into the zone. But then when I'm programming, I don't like to people to see what I'm doing. This guy over here, he's always watching me when I'm programming. So I have to change my prompt. So I go ahead and change my prompt. So now he can't see what I'm doing. And that's fine. I can't see where I am. But if I want to check really quickly, I just go CD and then CLS really quick like that. <laughs> so he can't be looking over my shoulder and seeing all my great code. OK, so what else? Windows command prompt's pretty cool. Run, run CMD, right? One of the other things I like about the Windows command prompt is if I accidentally forget that I'm running the Windows command prompt and I type ls, doesn't work. <laughs> Fantastic. So good to go. I can use dir. And the other thing I like is if, you, if you're a, a Linux user, you know pwd, print working directory, doesn't work here. I have one command that does two things. I've got cd for current directory, and I've got cd for change directory, right? Pretty cool. So really efficient use of commands. <laughs> So let's get started. So we want to create a new app. And we've got the .NET Core SDK installed. And all we have to do is go .NET New. And we can see all of those templates that are available. And you can see right here, we have Angular, and we have React, and React uh, plus Redux. So I'm going to go .NET New Angular, like this. And that's going to go ahead and actually create the app. It's going to restore all of my NuGet packages, and it's going to be ready to go. We'll have, a, we'll have a quick look. And you can see there's all the files. And it told me to do an NPM install. But I'm not going to do that, because otherwise it will never finish. We'll be here all day. NPM install downloads the entire internet. <laughs> I, uh, I haven't found it yet, but I'm pretty sure that if you look in node modules, you'll probably find some lolcats somewhere. So. Let's have a look at this one I created earlier. Fire it up in VS Code. Oh, go back a directory. I created these little, little shortcuts to make it very simple to use. Uh, VS Code, there we go. OK, so I've got the solution open. Let's have a look at what's included. And this is pretty much the same. It's just that I've uh, chosen a different name for the solution. So what you can see here is we've got our single page application and our ASP.NET Core application combined. So our single page application is contained within this client app. And then you can see a lot of it relates to the ASP.NET Core MVC stuff. So we've got our controllers here. We've got our home controller. And if we have a look at that, that actually has an index method, which returns a view. Uh, and that view is the entry point to our single page application. <coughs> So if we have a look here, you can see that's where, in this case, Angular hooks in and starts to load. Now, if we scroll down a little bit, we've got uh, our app settings, so our configuration. We've got our CS project, and we've got our um, package.json, and all of the other bits and pieces for our client side. So you can see it's all combined and ready to go. Now, all we need to do is fix up this prompt. So you can quickly get to the command prompt by typing CMD. Then you can type CLS, and you can change the color, and then you can change the prompt. So you can do it everywhere. You just need to, just need to get out. Wait, it's dollars G. Ah, look, we're wrong with that. No, that's too weird. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's too weird. OK, so to run the application, we just go .NET run. No, we don't. We always have to jump into our presentation directory. I'm going to do that five more times throughout this presentation. So if you want to remind me, you can. But otherwise, that's fine. I'll just keep doing it. So .NET Run. So this launches Kestrel. And that's going to serve our back end 
and our front end, so our Angular application and our ASP.NET Core application. And here's a handy little tip. You can actually control click on this and it will load up our app. So this is what you get out of the box. And what I like about this is this template actually tells you a little bit about what you're getting. So it tells you the technology stack that you're getting, and it also shows you the features that you're getting. So have a read of that and familiarize yourself with the template. And then on the side here, we also have a couple of examples. So this is an example of a single Angular component, a simple Angular component, and this is an example of one that actually fetches data from the server. So it's making a call to the sample data controller that's been set up. So if you um, refresh that, it just goes and gets new data each time. Oh, that's good. And that leads me to the next part of my uh, demonstration where I'll show you how to hook up client-side and server-side routing. So what happened there was I pressed refresh and let's see. And it didn't know how to find it because the server-side doesn't know about that route. Um, the client side knows about that route, so I can navigate to it no problem at all. But if I actually press enter on that, it goes to the server side. It goes to ASP.NET Core, and ASP.NET Core says, I don't know anything about that. Um, so what I've done today is disabled some of the features that come with this template so that we can see how, how they work, how they can be activated, and how they can be switched off, which is really important. So let's have a look here now. If we go straight into our startup.cs, which is pretty much where you do everything for ASP.NET Core, we've got a little fallback route. So this is something that comes with these JavaScript services templates. So this fallback route basically says, if you don't know how to handle a route, then just call home index, and that will pass it back to our client side, and the client side routing can pick it up. So all I have to do is uncomment that and now we have routing uh, for fallback. And I just want to touch on how the rest of it works. So we have static files. So the first thing it will do is try to return the static files. So that includes images. Then the second thing it will do is try to match an ASP.NET Core MVC route. And then if it can't, it will drop back to the fallback route. So with that change in place, I actually just need to uh, save and stop Kestrel. Which I can go. There we go. OK, and then I can just run it again. So if I go .NET run, that gets pretty old pretty quick because uh, you make a change to the server side, and you're constantly having to restart and um, uh, to, just to see your changes. So I'm going to show you how you can actually um, avoid doing that as well. So let's have a look. So now that we've got that fallback in place, if we go to fetch data and actually make a server request, so I press enter on the address bar. So it goes to the server side, server side doesn't recognize it and it falls back. So we have really nice client side and server side integration. So what else does this template give us? Well, it gives us server side pre-rendering. So server side pre-rendering basically means that it takes that client application, the server side application, compiles it on the server and instead of um, just returning the page where the client side will load normally, it actually returns the completed compiled version of that page. So it doesn't have to do it on the client. And one of the easiest ways that we can see that is to actually disable JavaScript. Because it's returning the completed view, we don't, we don't need to have JavaScript enabled. So JavaScript's disabled now. And so if I press Enter here, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing. Um, because JavaScript's disabled, single page applications can't run without JavaScript. So I'll just enable server side pre rendering. Let's see. So this is done just as a tag helper. So it's really nice and easy. You can see currently I'm just calling that one, um, but I'm going to change it to, let me make that a bit bigger for you guys, to this one. So you can see it's got a tag helper, ASP pre-render module, and it says this is the module to pre-render. And then once you're finished with that, return it to the client. And the client's going to get this page, and, and then it's going to load this main client here, OK? So the idea is that the client will load in the background, but it'll get this pre-rendered module first. And you're probably thinking, well, why would we want to do that? 
Well, the reason is then the client gets a really fast initial response. That page loads really fast. Um, and that gives the client confidence um, that you've built a very nice application and it's a site that they want to use. So they don't wait a few seconds while the page loads. They see it instantly. Um, the other benefits is that you can get improved search engine optimization. So for those uh, search engines that don't have a crawler that supports JavaScript, it's able to index it correctly. And you can also get great social media integration. Uh, so if you paste a link to your site, say into Messenger uh, or into um, Outlook, on the, uh, it'll generate a preview of your site. So let's refresh that now with server-side pre-rendering enabled. And we'll see the pre-rendered version of the site. So there we go. So now it's actually loading the pages with server-side pre-rendering enabled, even though JavaScript is disabled. And as I said, what needs to happen now is the main client needs to load in the background. But because I've disabled JavaScript, that's not going to happen. So we're seeing reduced functionality here until it does load. So if I click increment, nothing happens. There's no, there's no logic there that's being loaded. So I actually have to enable JavaScript again. Otherwise, I get every single one of my demos fail. And we refresh. And now we've got it working with server-side pre-rendering, and everything's smooth sailing. So what I might do now is we'll take, a, we'll take a step back. I said to you, it gets really annoying having to start and stop Kestrel all the time. So I'm going to show you a way so that you don't need to do that. When you make a change to the server-side file, it's just going to instantly reload so that you don't have to do that. And this is really simple. All we have to do is add a new package. So if we go to our csproj, this one. So this is the uh, package for the uh, project that I've created. And we have this uh, reference which I've already added. And it's a .NET CLI tool reference. So these tool references extend the .NET Core uh, CLI. And I've added Microsoft.NET Watcher Tools version 2. So that's already in place. So all I have to do at the command prompt, instead of running uh, .NET run, I can run .NET watch. And I'll just show you what you get with that. You can go .NET watch run or .NET watch test. So if you want your tests to run continuously, you can actually run that command. So you could open up a separate command prompt for that. Um, but for our purposes, we want to run .NET watch run. So now, once that's finished firing up, when we make a change to the server side, it will automatically rebuild, and those changes will be available to, for us to use. So one thing that's really cool about that is if you have a multi-screen setup, you can actually have the .NET Watch run on one screen, on one command prompt. And you can have the .NET run .NET run, sorry, .NET Watch test on another command prompt. So as you're developing, those things are just firing off, constantly rebuilding, constantly running your tests. So the hidden advantage of that is if you have that multi-monitor setup and someone walks up to you and they see all that stuff flying around, mm -hmm. they immediately think you're busy. <laughs> and hopefully, no guarantees, but hopefully they'll just walk away. <laughs> so concentration is really important. All right, so that's good to go. So let's have a look at some of the other features. Webpack dev middleware. So normally we'd have to start and stop Kestrel to enable Webpack dev middleware, but fortunately we don't with this one. So you can see in the startup, I've got app.usewebpack.dev-middleware. So I'm going to enable that. And now let's talk a little bit about what it is. So Webpack Dev Middleware basically runs Webpack for you whenever there's a change to your client-side files. So this is going to happen automatically now. Before I enabled that, we would have actually had to have run Webpack manually. And I didn't want to put you guys through that pain because it's hot in here, right? You've got enough pain. So we're, we're going to skip that step, and we're going to set it up to run automatically. So let's have a look. I'm going to make a simple change. I'll just do a quick refresh, make sure that's hooked up OK. We won't need that right now. Wait for that to load. Spinning. Look good. It's spinning the other way now. Have you ever noticed that? Maybe when you're on stage. All right, so we've got that ready to go. So let's make a change to the client side. I'm going to keep it simple. Maybe I'll just make a change to um, my nav menu. So I'll go to my nav component.html, and I'll change it from Northwind to Northwind Spark, because this is a single page application. Mm -hmm. It's much cooler than just Northwind. So we've made that change. If we press F5, because Webpack Dev Middleware is running in the background, it should come through pretty quickly. Yeah, there we go. So let me show you 
what happens in uh, this prompt here so you can see it firing off. So I'll just make another slight change so that you can see it. There we go. It's probably North Wind Spa Plus. It's even better. Okay, so watch the, watch the command prompt. Save, it detects a change and it automatically reloads. Mm -hmm. So the same thing is happening um, with our server side as is our client side. But you probably noticed the big problem there was that I actually had to refresh the browser. And who wants to refresh the browser, right? That's half your day gone. So <laughs> <laughs> let's have a look at how we can do that. So we're going to do that with hot module replacement. So hot module replacement is kind of the next evolution of Webpack Dev middleware. Basically, what it does is it says, oh, there's a client side change. I'm just going to inject that straight into your browser for you. So again, with your multi-monitor setup, you have that on one side and this on the other side. And you'll be able to see those changes instantly. So I'm going to make some changes to the nav menu this time. So let's see. First, we need to enable Webpack Dev middleware. So we'll do that. So everything's done in startup, as I keep saying. So let's scroll down here. And all we have to do is say hot module, sorry, hot module replacement equals true. So we're enabling hot module replacement. So now what I'll do is I'll show you that um, .NET watch kickoff. So if I go, uh, let's see, just make sure that's all good. If I go Control S to save, and then it says, oh yeah, startup has changed. So we're going to fire that off now. So startup. It takes a little bit longer with, with this, but it's quicker than me doing it manually. So it's just going to keep running in the background. So OK, Webpack Dev Middleware is enabled. So let's go ahead and make a change. I will change my nav menu styles this time. Thanks, buddy. He always has my back. All right, so let's see if um, Hub Module Replacement's working. And we'll see that in the console, and it'll say HMR connected. Yeah, OK, so that's a, that's a little bit hard to read. There we go, HMR connected. So if you see that, you're ready to go. And watch the console, because it's going to detect the changes and inject them. So what are we going to change? Let's change some colors. Let's just change some random colors. And make this. Cool. So watch this space. I hit Control S, and it automatically detects those changes and automatically implements those changes in the browser. So I didn't have to do anything, which is pretty cool. Um, so now our experience is we just code. We don't have to worry about building and refreshing. And that applies equally to our server side and our client side. We can have our tests running automatically um, just by running .NET watch test. Uh, so it's a pretty nice experience. And for me, that's kind of what I consider the ultimate development experience. It's nice. So let's continue. What else can we do? We can build a really nice web API. So in this section, I'm just going to show you an example of a typical web API. And I'm going to show you some simple things that you can do to bring it to the next level. So let's close down some of this. And open up this one. After the presentation, I'm going to um, tweet a link to these slides and the source code. Um, so if you're interested, you'll be able to download them. And you can see here, I've extended this application quite a lot. Before, we just had the presentation project. Now I've added an application layer, a domain layer, and a persistence layer. And as you probably guess, this is Northwind. So I've got all of those Northwind entities in there. And uh, this is fully seeded. I've got an initializer uh, in my persistence layer. So if you're looking for something to play with, this is um, a, pretty, a pretty nice domain model that you can play with. And it's uh, uh, .NET Core, um, cross-platform, uh, ready to go on any, any environment. So let's have a look now. Uh, I want to show you first a typical controller. So this is what I've called a typical customer's controller. And what's typical about it? Well, the first thing that you'll notice is that it's injecting the DB context directly. And that means it's using the DB context in each of the actions. And that also means that it's returning domain entities to the view. Now, what's, what's the problem with that? Anyone know? Well, the first thing that some people 
think is that it's hard to test. Well, the good, thing, the good news is it's not actually hard to test anymore. You can actually test using the EF core in-memory provider. Um, so there's no problems with that. You can do just in-memory tests and that's fine. The big problem is that you don't have anywhere to put your business logic except in the actions. So this controller is going to be a really big controller. And if you want to reuse that business logic elsewhere, you're not going to be able to do that. And the other problem with this is you're returning the domain entities. But generally, what the view needs is something more than a domain entity. Maybe it needs a list of locations or a list of, uh, in this case, orders that go with the customer. And the entity is not really going to do that. You need something specific to do that. So that's the main problem. But also, there's a lot of duplicated logic here. So you can see here, we're checking to see if the customer exists and we're returning not found. Here, we're checking to see if the model state is valid and we're returning a bad request. So this is all duplicated. Here, we're doing uh, it in a couple of places. And again here, and again here. We can make this much simpler. So let's have a look at a simple, uh, an improved controller. So I've done two things here. The first thing is I've removed the dependency on the DB context, and I've actually started to use CQRS. So I've separated out my commands, and I've separated out my queries. So you can see quite clearly what I'm ejecting here is just two queries and two commands. And the really nice thing about that is you know exactly what I'm injecting. Like, it's self-explanatory. If we jump in and have a look at one of these, you're going to see that. Let me load it up for you. So we'll get the customer list query, the implementation. You're going to see it's exactly what you expect. So I'm injecting the context into this particular object, and I'm returning a view model, which just has the customer ID and the company name. And it's asynchronous and everything, so it's, a, it's good to go. Now, what is the benefit of that? Well, you can use that somewhere else. So that's great for a start. Um, and it's no longer using those entities. It's returning view models. And it's very clear what this controller requires to run. It's, it's following the explicit dependencies principle. So you might be thinking, oh, but you're injecting um, the context, and you probably need to use the unit of work and repository. And uh, that, that's a fair point, but it depends on your approach. Um, this is highly testable. I actually have another talk in where I show you actually how you can test that using the in-memory provider. So you can check that out if you're interested. Um, there are still places where you might want to use the unit of work and the repository pattern, but this is definitely not one of them. So let's have a look. What have we done? We've injected um, a bunch of commands and queries, and now our methods have gotten a lot simpler. So we're just in this in this actual method, it's just one line of code to return a list of customers. And here we're uh, get returning the customer details. We've still got some duplicated logic though throughout. So let's have a look at how we can improve that. So what I did was create some filters. So the, in this particular one, it's checking to see if the customer exists. So if I go ahead and delete that, I've got a filter here called validate customer exists. And with that filter in place, I no, I no longer need that logic. So this is something that I've built. Let's have a quick look at it. So you can see this is just a simple a filter um, that I apply to the action. And all it does is says, OK, if this is applied and it contains an ID, let's check to see if that customer exists. If the customer doesn't exist, just return a 404. So that gets run before the body of the action, which means that, yeah, we'll return a 404 from this if the customer doesn't exist. So I can simplify this a little bit further now. So just a one-liner for that method. And that logic's nicely encapsulated elsewhere. So let's have a look at this post customer. So this is interesting. So this is just creating a new customer. So we just need to validate the model. So I have a filter for that. And now I can delete all of this logic. So just two lines for that logic. So pretty simple. Uh, and this is creating a new customer. And it's creating it using my uh, create customer command. Now, this is a pretty simple use case. But if the business use case was more complicated, for example, they wanted to validate an email, I could also inject that service and make a call to that service. So this is a place where I can really orchestrate that use case. I can do everything that needs to be done. And anywhere I want to create a customer, whether it's through the web interface or through a mobile app or even through seeding, I can have that same process kick off. OK, 
So what about put customer? Well, it gets pretty easy from here. I'm just going to say I want to validate the model, and I want to validate the customer exists. So I can go ahead and delete this logic now. There we go. And delete customer. Well, I just really need to validate the customer exists. We're not even doing that, so that's going to be an actual improvement on this method. So now we have a controller that's using CQRS, that's no longer using the DB context directly, and it's no longer using domain entities. And each of its methods is just one or two lines of code, and our business logic is encapsulated nicely elsewhere. So that's what I think makes up a really great controller. Who likes that approach? OK, great. So 75% of the room. So yeah, I've been using that uh, to create production apps, and it's been very, very helpful, very simple. So let's have a look at the next section. So we've, we've got a client side app. We've got our single page application, and we've got an awesome web API. But how do we bring those two back together? Well, typically, what I would do in the past is write a bunch of TypeScript code to connect to my web API. And now I have view models, so I have to create TypeScript versions of those view models manually. So that's quite painful. You're kind of actually violating the drive principle because there's a source of truth for that stuff, and the source of truth is on the server side. So ideally, what we'd like to do is just generate all of that. And uh, that's what I'm going to show you how to do using the Open API specification. So the Open API specification defines the standard for describing RESTful APIs. And it allows humans as well as computers to understand the capabilities of the service. So with that, we can do things like um, bring up Swagger UI, right? So that we can explore our API, try out some of its methods, maybe see where, where things are going wrong. So that's the part that allows humans to understand our API. And then for the computer side, we can have other clients actually read that specification um, and generate code from it. So we could actually generate a TypeScript client, for example, which is what we'll do. So if you would like to learn more about the Open API specification, you can check out that URL. But uh, basically, it's github.com OAI. Cool. So let's have a look at uh, a demonstration. OK. So when you start uh, working with Swagger or um, Open API, the first thing you have to decide is which tool chain will I use. So the tool chain is the things that are capable of generating and consuming the specification. So a lot of people use Swagger. A lot of people use Swashbuckle. I use NSwag. So there's a lot of um, choices out there. The thing that I like about NSwag is it has an end-to-end -end tool chain. So I can generate the specification. I can consume the specification. I can use Swagger UI. And it all seems to work nicely. Um, so to configure NSwag, all you have to do is add a reference to your, let me make that a little bit bigger, add a reference to your uh, package, uh, so to your CS project. So you can see I've got a reference to NSwag ASP Net Core uh, version 11.72. Uh, so with that in place, I can update my startup.cs. And there's a, just a couple of changes that I need to make. So the first change is to is this command. So I'm actually saying use Swagger UI. And by using Swagger UI, that basically exposes my definition document for my API. And then I have to make a change to my SPA fallback route, right? Because when I access Swagger UI, I'm going my application slash Swagger. OK, but you know that it's not going to recognize that route. So we just make this little exception here. So you can see I've commented out map SPA fallback route. And I say, when the if the request path doesn't start with slash Swagger, then use the fallback. Otherwise, don't worry about it. We know what to do. So with that in place, let's launch this app. So dot net watch run. Oops. Well, that's two. OK. Wait for that to start, and then we'll be able to navigate to it. So swagger. Yeah, watch takes a little bit longer to start than just uh, .NET run, um, but well worth the effort. 
Once it starts, it's faster. Great. So now we can go to Swagger. And this is our human readable version of our API. So I'm going to zoom in. OK, so a couple of things that you'll see is that I've got two um, things in my specification. I've got customers and sample data. Now that relates to the two controllers that I've created. But there are some other controllers in there. And I want to show you how I actually hid those. Because it's, you don't want the home controller showing in your specification. It doesn't expose any API endpoints because it's MVC. Um, so I just specify this attribute, API Explorer settings ignore API. So it doesn't come up here. And I've also ignored the typical customer's controller. So it doesn't come up here either. So you can, you can define what you want to include. But let's have a look at Swagger UI. So we can come here, and we can explore all of the different actions on this API. And if we come down here and go try it out, we get a list of customers. And so we've got, we've got one of these UIs generated for each of uh, our actions on the customer's controller. So we can really have a play with that. And you know, if we run into some troubles and we're debugging an issue, this can be a place where we can actually go and try things out and see what maybe went wrong. So that's nice for us as developers. Uh, but what about for us as computers? Uh, when we need to actually generate code. So I'd run nswag studio. And with nswag studio, I can actually generate code. So you can see here that I'm pointing to, uh, I'm pointing to the Swagger specification. So if I was to load that, that's a JSON document. If I was to actually load that in the browser, you'll see the raw uh, specification that was generated. Just zoom back out. Here we go. So that's the specification. That's what gets generated. That's what Swagger UI runs off. And that's what we're going to generate code based off. So if I come back to NSwag Studio, I can actually say, OK, I want to create a TypeScript client. So I click on TypeScript client, and I can define it um, as suits me. So you can see here I've chosen TypeScript version 2. Uh, I've got Angular. I'm going to specify that my services, my Angular services, should be called service. And I can go generate outputs. And it's actually gone ahead and created me a whole bunch of code. So now that I can interact with my API. And it's done two things which are really great. So you can see I've got an interface there. And I've got all of my methods for my customer service. And then if I was to scroll down a long way, I would see the sample data service in there as well. So I can uh, ac access the methods of the sample data service. And that's really cool just by itself. So you can see there um, sample data, weather forecasts. So that's great. But the, but the thing that I really like is it's also generated all of my view models. So now I have uh, all my view models available on the client side to use. I don't have to write any of that TypeScript code myself. And, and, it, and it's good quality. Like it, it works really well for us, and we do use it uh, in production. So what, where do we take it from here? So using NSWAG Studio, what we can actually do is uh, save a copy of this. So if we go File, and we go Save As, we can save an nswag.json file. And we can add that to uh, the root of our application. And then we can use the nswag CLI to actually generate that for us anytime that um, we want to create a new version. So we, we update our um, web API, and we need to generate a new version. Or we make a change to our view model, so we want to generate a new version. We can do that over here. So the important thing to remember is you need to keep um, your service running, because if it can't access uh, the specification, uh, then it can't do any generation. So you can see here I've got that nswag.json file ready to go. And down the bottom, I've actually said, hey, I want you to put a new service for me in client app, app services. So if we come up here, there's nothing there at the moment. So I'll open up my command prompt. I'll grab a new one. And I just have to jump into presentation. And I can run nswag run. So that's going to go ahead and create that service for me. And it's created it there. And it's ready to use in my application. 
just as we saw before. So really simple. We don't have to write any of that code now. Um, it's just available for us, and we can regenerate it uh, any time that we want. So let's have a look. So what are the next steps? So who, who here found this presentation useful and would like to give it a try? OK, great. Well, yeah, like 80%. Fantastic. So if you're on the Windows environment and you like to use Visual Studio 2017, the only thing that you need to do is make sure that you're on version 15.3 or greater. So that means if you've updated since August, you're good to go. You've got those templates available, and you can begin creating the app. Now, if you're on any other environment, including Windows, you might like to try Visual Studio Code. It's a great editor. I use it for most of my client-side development. But of course, you can use anything at all that you like. I have tested this out with Notepad and Windows Command Prompt. Works fine. You get all of the same features, so go for it. Uh, so the other things that you'll need is the .NET Core SDK version 2 or greater and Node.js version 6 or later. So if you have those things in place, you're good to go. You can just type .NET new Angular and launch it. So that's it. So with a few simple clicks or a, simple, a single command, uh, you can actually get started building single page apps using ASP.NET Core 2.0. Thank you. <laughs>